Welcome to the second season of Murder 20 Podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Just 10 miles from the Pacific coastline near San Francisco is a small town of Orinda. In the 1980s, it had a population of 16,000. The small town was well known for its competitive schools where students excelled in academics. In 1984, Bernadette Prodi was 15 and a sophomore attending grade 10 at Miramonte High School, a pretty blonde with a circle of friends. But Bernadette's family didn't come from a lot of money like many of the students at her high school, and that led her to have feelings of self-doubt. Growing up, she attended Catholic school and her parents were strict. Her father was an engineer and she was the youngest of five children. She babysat children in the neighborhood but still couldn't afford new clothes. She didn't have her own car but instead drove the family's old beat up, dented, mustard yellow Ford Pinto. Even though she studied hard, she never felt she was good enough and strived to have people like her. Bernadette worked so hard at everything. She wanted to be a cheerleader and tried out for the squad, practiced really hard, and did her best. Afterwards, she told a friend she couldn't believe she didn't make it. Bernadette was a member of the swim team, but wasn't picked to be on the school's varsity team. She also tried out for the yearbook club, but wasn't selected. Then she pinned her hopes on joining the Bobo Links, or Bobbies as they were called, an off-campus social group of 30 high school girls who volunteered at a rehabilitation center. It was a prestigious position, and Bernadette wanted it badly. The trouble is, you can't try out to be a Bobby, but rather, they pick you. And Bernadette's luck looked like it was changing. She had just been invited to become a member. Kirsten Costas also attended Miramonte High School as a sophomore. She too was pretty with dark curly hair. Her outgoing personality was a joy for others to be around and she naturally attracted many friends and was very popular. Kirsten's father had a well-paying job as an executive and it afforded her to wear the latest styles to school. Kirsten naturally excelled at everything she tried. She was an all-around athlete who swam, skied, played soccer, was a gymnast, loved the ballet, and was a great dancer. On the swim team, she was selected for the school's varsity team. She belonged to the yearbook club and was selected to be a cheerleader. But then an odd thing happened. Someone broke into her locker at school. They left a note with a bottle of beer, stating that she shouldn't have been chosen to be a cheerleader because she drank beer. Kirsten shrugged it off and in June attended a cheerleading camp to learn new routines to prepare for the upcoming year. And wouldn't you know it, her team won an award. Although Bernadette and Kirsten both attended the same high school of 1,300 students, they didn't move in the same social circles. However, on occasion their paths would cross. People Magazine described a school trip that they both went on. Although Bernadette couldn't afford new equipment 
She brought an old pair of skis and boots and was having fun. That is, until Kirsten pointed them out. Bernadette felt that was unnecessary. Even though it was true, no one else in the group felt the need to say anything except Kirsten. Bernadette didn't see herself as popular enough. Sure, she had a circle of friends, but she wasn't popular to the extent she desired. She brushed aside her good looks and high marks and dwelled on her failures. Kirsten became a symbol for everything that went wrong in Bernadette's life. For every rejection she faced, for every time she felt she wasn't good enough or popular enough. She wallowed in self-pity and loathed her self-worth. In June, the sunshine beamed down and warmed the eager faces of the students at Miramonte High School. It was June in 1984, and soon they would be off for the summer. But before school was out for the year, Bernadette had something she needed to achieve. She wanted to become friends with Kirsten and be as popular as her. On June 21st, while Kirsten was away at cheerleading camp, Bernadette called her home. Her mother Barrett answered. Bernadette told her there was going to be a secret initiation dinner for the Bobbies and that Kirsten was invited, and that she'd pick her up at 9 o'clock Saturday night. When Saturday night arrived, Kirsten's parents left with their young son Peter to attend a potluck dinner for his baseball team. Barrett called home at 8.20 p.m. and told Kirsten to have a good time and reminded her to turn the porch light on. At 9 p.m., Bernadette pulled into the Costas driveway. Kirsten opened the passenger side and sat down at Bernadette's beat-up old Ford Pinto. She drove them to a parking lot of a local church, and the two girls started to talk. After 40 minutes, Kirsten realized that she had been set up and that there was no initiation dinner. Bernadette was acting weird, and it scared her. She opened the door and walked down the road, leaving Bernadette behind. Alex and his wife Mary had just finished playing a game of cards with their neighbors when they heard a knock on the door. Alex opened it to see a frightened Kirsten. Further down on the front walkway lurked Bernadette. Kirsten was upset and asked to borrow the phone to call her parents. But when she wasn't able to reach them, Alex offered to drive her home to a neighbor's. As Alex was backing down his driveway, he noticed a beat-up Pinto Park nearby. Kirsten mentioned that she had been in that car and knew the person driving. Kirsten was grateful for the ride. Her nightmare was almost over. As Alex drove, he noticed the Pinto following them. Alex pulled up to Kirsten's neighbor's house and said he'd wait until she went inside. Kirsten headed for the front door. Then Bernadette walked past his car and caught up to Kirsten on the front porch. Without warning, Bernadette lunged. He saw her hand come up and strike Kirsten and thought they were fighting. Kirsten got up and tried to run back to Alex's car, but Bernadette's hand held a knife. She raised it up again and brought it down and stabbed Kirsten again and again, a total of five times. Kirsten let out a blood-curdling scream. Alex noticed a flash of red 
in Bernadette's hand. Then Bernadette fled back to her car and raced off. Alex took after her. Arthur, a neighbor, heard Kirsten scream and opened his front door. She managed to stagger towards him, crying out, Help me! Help me! I've been stabbed! Her shirt drenched in blood. He held out his arms, and she fell into them. Arthur tried to hold her hand and said a prayer for her. Bernadette managed to lose Alex, and he returned to Kirsten. Minutes later, her family arrived home to see blue and red lights flashing. Kirsten's father's heart raced when he saw his daughter lying in the ambulance. She was rushed to the hospital. Kirsten was pronounced dead at 11.02 p.m. She died one month short of her 16th birthday. Meanwhile, Bernadette drove home just as her mother was heading out for a walk. Elaine didn't notice anything unusual about her daughter. The Contra County Sheriff's Office immediately began an investigation into Kirsten's murder. The Bobby's organization confirmed that there had been no event planned for that night. The witnesses at the scene described her killer as a chunky woman driving a yellow or orange Ford Pinto with a loud motor. Hundreds attended Kirsten's funeral, including her family, friends, and fellow classmates. And among them was Bernadette. Reverend James Little told the standing room only crowd about Kirsten's love of music, and in particular, the Broadway musical Cats. And he quoted from its lyrics, a poem by T.S. Eliot. All alone in the moonlight, I can smile on the old days. When the dawn comes, the night will be a memory, and a new day begins. In early July, the Oakland Tribune reported that all 42 members of the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office were working on the case and that they'd received hundreds of calls on a special 24-hour hotline, but still they had no leads. A $50,000 reward was offered for information leading to an arrest and conviction of her murderer. Meanwhile, Bernadette blocked out what she had done and went on with her life. Just as summer wound down and school was about to start, Kirsten's parents made a public plea for their daughter's killer to come forward. They felt that she might have been killed out of jealousy. Her father said they couldn't move forward until her killer was caught. Every night, all he thought about was the terror Kirsten must have felt. In Kirsten's memory, the students planted a large magnolia tree in front of her high school. They were on edge that her killer was still on the loose, and rumors going around were that it was a student. They wondered who among them could do such a horrendous thing. Many of the girls with long blonde hair cut it short to distance themselves from the description of her killer. Homicide investigators began talking to students, and two of them were even given lie detector tests. They were cleared, but suspicion hung over them. One of the students they interviewed was Bernadette. She remained calm and casual and did not show any remorse that Christian was gone and asked the investigator, Do you think I did it? 
In October, the sheriff's office had followed up on 800 leads and still had no suspect. Investigators felt that Kirsten knew her killer. At this point, they needed a break to solve the case. The FBI were brought in, specially trained agents at their behavioral sciences unit in Quantico, Virginia, developed a profile of the killer. It provided personality traits and how the killer may have responded or acted. Sheriff's investigators used this profile and compared it to the interviews they had conducted. And one person stood out. Bernadette. Six months after Kirsten's murder, on Friday, December 7th, Bernadette was questioned by the FBI. People magazine reported that Agent Ronald Hilly went over their psychological profile of the killer and that Bernadette quietly said, It sounds just like me. She did not confess and asked to go home. Over the weekend, Bernadette put pen to paper and made a list, which included, I have caused a lot of hurt and pain to a lot of people. I regret what I did. I can't bring Kristen back or change time. Then on Monday night, she asked her mother if they could talk. Her mother was tired and said they could after she took a short nap, but she slept right through until the next morning. When she awoke, Bernadette told her she'd written her a note, left it on the kitchen counter, and asked her mother to wait 30 minutes before reading it, then left for school. Her mother diligently waited. What she read was nothing she could have ever imagined. Bernadette told her parents she loved them and that the FBI thinks she did it, and they were right. She went on to say, Please don't say, how could you, or why, because I don't understand this, and I don't know why. Elaine picked up Bernadette at school. She and Bernadette's father, Raymond, drove their daughter to the sheriff's office. In a second interview with FBI agent Ronald Hilly, she finally confessed. The San Francisco Examiner reported that she said she only intended to hurt Kirsten and not kill her. It was her fear of being rejected and that Kirsten might tell others that she was weird that drove her to murder. When the detective asked her if she was sorry, she replied, I only remember the mean things about her. She told them that she had dreams of Kirsten in which she'd apologized to her. 16-year-old Bernadette was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Because Bernadette was a minor, the maximum sentence she faced was custody in a juvenile facility until she was 25. At her detention hearing a few days later, the Los Angeles Times reported that she appeared dressed in blue jeans and a pink sweatshirt and was holding her mother's hand. Bernadette fled innocent. In March 1985, Bernadette went to trial. Her fate would be determined by a judge alone. The courtroom was packed. Her defense lawyer never denied the murder, but presented Bernadette as naive and a teenager who acted on impulse and was remorseful for her actions. But the prosecution disagreed and said that when Bernadette approached Kirsten with the knife, she had time to think about what she was about to do. 
and she could have withdrawn. Instead, she chose to kill. Bernadette sold her sister Gina, testified that she had used a knife to cut up vegetables while eating on her lunch break at work and had left it in the car. After three days of testimony, the judge reached a verdict. Guilty of second-degree murder. He felt that the prosecution had not proved that the murder was premeditated. Kirsten was sentenced to nine years in a juvenile facility. She was denied parole twice. At her second hearing, the panel heard Bernadette was still having difficulty with rage and processing her feelings of jealousy and rejection, and they felt that she still posed a risk to the community. Bernadette was eventually paroled after seven years when she was 22. At the age of 25, she was a free woman. It has been rumored that she has changed her name, is married with a child, and lives in another state. Kirsten's parents were shocked when she received parole and felt that she'd gotten away with murder. Bernadette wanted to be like their daughter. She wanted to be accepted by her and wanted to talk to her. But instead, she silenced Kirsten forever. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Anthony Sully. He was a cop entrusted to protect citizens. Instead, in his cocaine-fueled delusions, he became their judge and executioner. But the former cop left his fingerprint in cement that sealed his future on death row. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fastlane Studios, and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murder 20com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.